So, hello everyone and welcome to the Making the Most of Your Time webinar. I'm just going to quickly go through a little bit of housekeeping in terms of Zoom and then run through a quick intro um, to our organisation and the webinar uh, before I introduce the wonderful Philip Anderson Dyer, who's our guest speaker today. So, um, I am Maggie Broadley and I'm Programmes Manager for DGU. Um, today, uh, the webinar is being recorded. We will utilise this and, and we will post it on our website and social media so that it's a resource going forward. And if anyone's uncomfortable with that, um, they can leave now, but please don't. <laughs> um, we are using the chat. You've already should have a message from Tabby. Um, does everyone who's here know how to use the chat? It's um, the control is located at the bottom of the, 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 the screen. You just click on to chat and uh, the chat comes up along the side. You just, if you would like to type in any questions that you might have through the uh, presentation, then Tabby, who is with us today, and Tabby's our um, creative producer, she will manage the chat and facilitate that between um, yourselves and, and Phil. Um, I also just in case there's, there's the different controls um, in terms of gallery view and speaker view which is at the top of the screen. Um, I don't have to bother with anything about fire alarms or anything because we're all virtual. <laughs> um, so I shall swiftly begin. So DG is a membership organisation, and Maggie, yeah, Maggie, sorry, I need to interrupt you. Do you want to start the? Is the? Uh, do you want to start the slideshow? It should. It should be because what we are, what we are seeing is the actual um, presentation view, not not the slideshow view. Right. Can you show me then, Tabby? Because it, it should be. On it, in terms of my screen, it's just got the presentation view. Right, you stop sharing and I'll do it. Right, at mine. okay, thank you. So, there's always technology, and then there's always Egypts like me who obviously can't operate the technology properly. Oh, Maggie, you're not an Egypt, not at all. These you things happen, yeah. they always do happen. Uh -huh. so. We did try this out before, and this has happened with literally every webinar. Um, it works beforehand and it doesn't work um, in the, the, the present, the actual Zoom. Oh, that's just so, the fun of it. Okay, there you are. Can, I, can everyone see that okay? That's good. Yeah, so I'll go to the first slide. Maggie. Yeah, the thing, yeah. So I was just explaining that for anyone who doesn't know about DGU, that we are a membership organisation. We are here to promote the creative practitioners and creative organisations across the region to support you in what you do, to also help bring um, inward investment into the creative in industries across the region. Um, what I would say, our DG the Next Level webinar is part of Creatives Unlimited programme. Um, this ties in with our core values and if you would like to I would recommend you check out our strategic plan, Distill. There's a link to that in the presentation, and also our website. Um, we are really here to make we, um, to make Dumfries and Gallery the place where artists want to come, live, and make a living. Um, and also, we are here to support those artists, organisations, and the local communities and people uh, in which they live and work with. So, um, just a, a, another brief. Um, overview of, of our one year programme which is Creatives Unlimited and that is a combination of, of activities and, and the programme has been developed through consultation with our partners and with individual practitioners and our members and it's based around three strands, the first of which is growing leaders. Um, we have a, a Leaders Unlimited programme which we've taken um, which we've had to pause, but we, we've been we're looking at ways of potentially taking that on um, online with the next level webinars, which are here to offer support and professional creative skills development. The circuit uh, is um, uh, four uh, uh, over across the year, four um, meetings and gatherings 
unfortunately, we've had to pause those too. Um, um, and that those were for people to come together, speak, you know, have over food and some convivial um, chat, um, connect with one another. Second strand is our um, growing ambition, and that's kind of more about creative um, development. We had the Bright Sparks programme, which uh, awarded um, creative practitioners a significant um, award to take a creative risk, something that we don't often get a chance to do. Um, also, our Innovate Cultivate uh, innovate and um, create cultivate program that's a smaller um, creative development um, pro program 750 pounds um, it's not for visual artists or craft makers that's the VACMA awards um, and that's just been launched so I would check that out on our website um, and investment ready which is as will be a series of it's it's not just about money, it's about helping support you, how to tell your story, how to, um, these outcomes, outputs um, for funders and funding applications, but also it's, there's an element of it which is looking at your creative practice and how to monetize that and increase your profitability. Um, and the last is, is our growing visibility and that was platform. We intend to commission a film um, which will promote the great work that's going on Unfortunately, that at the moment is paused too. Um, so, without further ado, um, I'd like to thank our funders who are very important. Creatives Unlimited has been supported by um, Creative Scotland uh, through big lottery funding. Also the Hollywood Trust, who we're delighted to have supported our youth programme, and uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council, who are supporting the Innovate the ICC award but also we have a service level agreement with them throughout the year um, and DGU itself is a registered charity managed by a volunteer board of directors. So now we come to the really um, the, the great part of, of the day and I'd like to have great pleasure in introducing Philip or Phil um, Anderson Dyer. Phil um, has first became interested in theatre um, when working at the Arts Theatre. He's had extensive back uh, experience in all facets of the business, backstage, front of house, all of those things that you know are under the surface but actually are really, really, really important in, in keeping the creative world going around. Um, and but he also has his own theatrical credits include over 70 plays. Not bad in one so young, I think. Uh, but um, so, um, and he, Phil lives here in, in the region with his wife and, and lovely son. Um, he's established uh, Bunbury Banter um, and he has earned a place as one of five finalists in the Channel 4 Talent Award and also nominated for Best Producer in Radio Academy Awards. So I am delighted and really looking forward to hear what Phil has to say in terms of how we can all make better use of our time because as creatives we juggle we juggle thank you thank you Mike. Hello. I'll say hello um uh first I want to say thank you DGU for luring me out of uh, what I'm calling my lockdown cave um and sort of coming online to see uh, all of you lovely lot hello um I'm, as uh, Maggie just said, I'm Philip Anderson Dyer. I, I, it's a difficult title, but I call myself uh, creative producer, which ultimately means for me, rather than just physically being the engine behind making sure projects work, um, I'm also a part of the creative process to begin the projects as well. So um, that's what I do. Um, we've just finished our latest blurb that basically constantly morphs to describe a little bit about Bunbury Banter. We're a Dumfries and Galloway based award-winning theatre company that create multi-sensory immersive productions for and with our community looking outward to the world. That's our latest, desperately trying not to be a little bit too uh, horrific, but that's the latest thing that pretty much surmises what we do. Um, uh, myself, Ali, my wife, who you may meet or see her work at some point, um, the artistic director of our company, our Westie Higgins, um, who is one of the most important people in our family, um, and I moved here in 2014 
um, from London uh, to basically create work here. Uh, we were then joined by, as Maggie said, our son, Michael, um, who's awesome, but a massive time bandit. Um, and then most recently, we've just got a cat called Beckett, um, who is a killer and is out there getting mice right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, for, not for the faint hearted, that one. Um, we believe that um, world class work can be made anywhere. Um, it doesn't have to be just for the central belt or major cities. Um, and it's one of the main reasons that after scouring the country, uh, we decided to move here, uh, partly because it's beautiful and we utterly are in love with the region, but also because uh, because of that region, uh, reason, sorry, that we know we used to make work, as said, in London for a long time. And uh, it, 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 the sort of regional, more rural areas have historically suffered from not getting as much work made here. So um, uh, whilst that's changing, which is fabulous, uh, we're sort of very keen to be part of that. Um, so since moving here, we've made nine full stage productions. Uh, the last one was in Halloween last year was Beneath the Dust, which we took over a building in Dumfries and uh, it was a horror, scary kind of Halloween immersive experience. Um, and we were lucky enough to get critical acclaim from the Scotsman. Uh, we also run three creative learning programs in and outside of schools, um, which are ongoing. And we're currently in our inaugural year of our Young Playwrights program, which we've had to move completely online during this lockdown, um, which has worked really well for them actually, because they've got access to playwrights they wouldn't usually get to because they're too busy. So that's actually worked quite well for them. Um, so that I, is why I suspect I've been asked to do this because I have quite a lot to juggle and on top of my 20 month old uh, child and the fundraising that has to happen to make these things work. Um, but it's important to say that I, I really don't know everything. I'm really not all knowledgeable. Um, I'm completely fallible and I'm not perfect. Um, but I've got to, and I've got to today where where I am right now, where I'm solely a creative practitioner by making an absolute ton of mistakes. Um, and I believe you have to make mistakes. Um, in fact, it's a critical part of it. Um, so my plan with this webinar is to try and impart some of what I've learned and what has worked for me um, in the hope that may of it's some of it may work for you. Uh, there'll be a few videos and possibly some audio clips as well along the way. And if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. And I think Tabby will be collating them. Um, I, uh, and yeah, and then I'll, and, and if not, just sit back and enjoy. So yes. um, if you've got questions, if you put them in chat, I will make sure that we include them in the Q&A after Phil's presentation, which I will start right now, Phil, if that's okay. Um, yeah, please do. Right, just give me one second. There we are. There you are, Phil. Okay, so there should also be a video clip about to yeah. come on as well, I believe. Okay. I'm still that kid who can't settle down or focus for more than five or ten minutes at a time, and I remain a guy who possesses no special gift of talent or skill. All I do is take really big, ambitious projects that people seem to marvel at, break them down to their simplest form, and then just make marginal improvements along the way to improve my odds of achieving them. And so the whole reason I'm giving this talk is I'm hoping to inspire several of you to pull some of those ambitious dreams that you have for yourself off the bookshelf and start pursuing them by making that marginal adjustment to your routine. Okay, so, so right, so that's uh, the first section I was sort of given to talk about was realistically focusing your goals. Um, well, I, I believe we all have a massive ambitions for our life goals and dreams and hopes, um, both in careers and home life. Um, I suppose the difficult thing is how do you try to translate them into actually happening? Um, I think that's A, you 
trying to keep them real, it's a balance between keeping them realis, realistic and B, perhaps more importantly, what steps are you going to take to achieve them? Um, so I, I speak to a lot of people who want, want to be. Uh, oh, I've got a bit of feedback going on. Let me take my speaker off. There we are. Um, I speak to a lot of people who want to be artists and. Uh, it's the balance between uh, going from your full-time job into gradually allowing your art to take over the, the, that part of your life. Um, and, and that's really hard. Uh, so I, I, I always speak to them about how likely is it that they're going to be able to achieve this, um, seeking some critical feedback from people they trust who ideally work in that industry, who are going to tell them, a the percentage chances which is really boring but true and worth looking at that you can actually achieve what you want to and um what steps you need to actually do to do this uh or more often than not i've come to the conclusion with those people i've spoken to that perhaps keep it as a hobby but it also depends how determined you are to do it it needs to be in your uh absolute blood and heart and soul that you need to be an artist i believe to to do it because it's an extremely hard career. Um, where are we? There we are. So, um, uh, and also, it's worth saying, certainly my wife is a good example of this. Ali, when she was training to be an actress, she was working four jobs um, as well as training. Um, and it's kind of what you need to do. It's, are you willing to do multiple jobs at the same time until you're willing, uh, willing and ready to swap over? So it's, it's not easy. But if you are wanting to do it, um, and I think this is what I use in my work anyway, is to set milestones to start off with. Uh, so for me, milestones are markers which you set yourself in advance, which alert you um, as to whether you're on track or not. They help to refocus you, keep you to schedule, and make sure you're aware of how well you're keeping to your schedule in order to reach your goal, if that makes sense. Um, also, I heavily advocate, and I do it myself quite often, is to uh, speak to a mentor. Um, mentors are fabulous, partly because they reflect back at you what you've already been telling them but haven't totally understood yourself. Um, and also, if they're in your area that you're looking to work in, they're likely to be able to point you in directions at points as well. So they're e extremely useful. Uh, and if not, touched on this before, uh, keep the art as a very healthy hobby, um, which uh, I, um, a lot of artists that I speak to would generally suggest that you do unless you have to do it. So then we're on to the next slide, Tabby. Okay, and a sound clip. Okay. All right. So, um, did you hear that? Do you want to hear it again? I'm not sure. There. Try it again. Perfect. I heard that one that time. Um, certainly it came through my end. Um, so I, I always listen to that, that tune, or I used to historically listen to that song before I went for a big job opportunity or something, because it helped refocus me into, into being there and being present and omnipresent to be able to try and take advantage of it. Um, but, you know, I, it, whether or not I got it wasn't reflective as to whether I listened to it, to be fair. So, um, per, but perfect time management, A, who on earth has it? Uh, but B, it is obviously the holy grail that we're all seeking. Um, we all struggle to prioritise our time as well as we'd like to. Um, I work by lists, and I believe that personally that's, that's the only way I can do all of the different jobs I have to do to get to my milestones and therefore complete all of the jobs I need to do to fulfill funders' needs, to make a project happen, um, and whatnot, so so forth. Um, I use an online one, but um, I, I certainly know a lot of people that just use a, a pen and paper, which uh, which which still works. Um, I find it very cathartic to tick something off when I've done it. 
it's fabulous um uh, yeah and then you're able to also match it up to your milestones and be able to go am i doing all the steps i need to do to be able to fulfill my next milestone and hence get to the end of the job i'm trying to get to uh, so when i started a working day and i was speaking to, to um someone about this yesterday in fact but when i start my working day i do it differently than some people i set myself a very achievable list of things to do um because i've learned that if i don't i'll get to the end of the day and be possibly a little bit disappointed in what i've done whereas if i set myself check my reply to emails i don't know um work out some sticky pages on my website and uh, do an approximate draft of a funding application um then as long as i do that anything else is a total bonus and if not then it, you know at least i've felt like i've achieved something that day which is fabulous and very helpful um I don't know if any of you have come across the approximate way of working. I was taught this by uh, a, 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 one of my mentors actually many years ago, that um, when you're writing a funding application, for example, or a job application or anything that's longer than you can generally finish in one go, um, the approximate way of working is to ensure you put something in each box of the application form um, and finish it each time you go through it, um, which means that A, you feel good about it when you finish it, and B, every time you come back to it, you strengthen it every time you go through it. So that's the way that I do funding applications. Um, I will always finish it each time. And therefore, I, I find that after doing that X amount of times, it's finished and I feel good along the way as well. So, hello, Kathy, as well. So um, the, the next, I think we're on to the next slide, uh, Tabby. There you go. And we've have a we video as well, I think, on this one. Yeah, there we go. It's really important to understand the weaknesses and how your brain processes information. When you're focusing on something, you activate a network in your brain that involves the prefrontal cortex and its connectivity with the rest of the brain. If there is a distraction, it degrades the strength of this connectivity and that degrades your performance. So yeah, I put that on there because um, I, I, thought I like everyone, I think, find it, find it really difficult to just stay focused on the job in hand in, that, in the moment you're working on it. Um, it's been incredibly difficult through this uh, lockdown because personally we would have uh, our, our delightful son would normally be off at his childminders for three most days for most of three days in a week um if that makes sense and therefore he's not he's here he's wonderful he's the light of our world but he really is not quiet and i wouldn't want him to be quiet but it means that we need to shut ourselves off into a totally different part of the world uh, part of the house not world and um and just focus in which means for me turning off my phone which is off right now and uh turning everything off that possibly can be and just focusing in. Um, I also do a very set structure of my day, which I find works. I don't know if it works for other people, but what I do is um, I start uh, every day I start off emails and reply to them and then I turn off my email program um, because otherwise I spend the entire day just playing tennis um, with people's responses and you have those wonderful and fabulous people who reply to you within five seconds but then it means you're back replying to them and oh, yeah it becomes a bit of a pain um right and that means i don't get through my goals uh, i may get to something in the email but that's not what i'm aiming for for the day um and eventually that impacts on my milestones and that turns into my goals not being achieved in the time frames i want to so and let also the same goes for social media for me unless i've got a but we, and we have in the company in our company specific points in the day that we put posts online um, and therefore we try not to go online other than that particularly um, and it's very yeah it's very luring just to sit there and scroll um, but it doesn't actually get you to where you want to get to sadly so I have to be really strict about that um, that's about and also uh, with that it's about having for me it's about having set points in the day where you're actually working as a whole as well so uh we we've had to split up the day between myself and my wife during this lockdown time where 
um, one of us has the morning, one of us has the afternoon, um, so we can childcare on the other one. Um, and it's actually really nice and helpful in because in the normal job which I've done, where someone is your boss and they give you money, um, which is a really weird experience for me nowadays because that doesn't happen very often. Um, but it's a uh, um, in my world now, I'm the boss, and therefore I have worked. 20 hours a day before in the past and that's not very helpful or healthy for my life so I've learned to keep it within parameters of normal working hours um, and normal days of the week which actually helps quite a lot. Um, one of my mentors is uh, runs a company in Edinburgh called Gridiron who are fabulous and uh, make site specific work and they're, they're incredible um, but she works four days a week um that's it that's all she works and that's able she's able to because she does that prioritize really well during the days um because she has to to achieve what she needs to and uh and then she's got a clear and free mind because she's had three days off every week so um that is something which i am striving to work towards but haven't quite got to but I think we're on to the next slide, Tabby, on the learning how to say no. Okay. With our wee sound. Don't know how to say no to this. Don't know how to say no to this. So yeah, that's from that's from Hamilton um, because I thought we I should try and get something theatrical and um, uh, jazz hands into it, but yeah, I uh, just couldn't find a video for it. Um, so. Uh, no is and i literally i've been trying to learn this a lot myself recently because we live um in a yes society that uh it's been sort of drummed into us ever since we were toddlers to say yes rather than no um and no is actually the most powerful word in the world because people don't like using it very much and if you learn to use it then you have more value for your time and you can actually say yes to the things you want to say yes to. It sounds really obvious, but um, the best piece of advice I picked up recently was from a philosopher, although I've, I've searched the internet and I cannot recall who said it, but they said, um, you'll, you'll only have a certain amount of time, resources and energy, unless you master the art of saying no when the occasion merits it, then you will become overburdened and find it extremely hard to reach your own goals. Um, yeah, as I was saying, we are all experts at saying no when we're about three. My son is fabulous at saying no um, at the moment, and uh, and that's brilliant. But uh, gradually, life beats that out of us. So um, we start, we spend so much time saying yes to things that I think it kind of comes habit. Um, our default becomes yes instead of no, and we might start to feel guilty if we say no occasionally um, because we're conditioned for yes. So and if we say no, we think we're letting someone down or something which we're not um so maybe try and switch it around is what i've been trying to work on um find ways of kindly saying no as your default position rather than yes um the point of this isn't to create increase your freedom and happiness uh because not being able to say no has a huge um opportunity cost uh in that it steals energy from the yes that really matters uh, you won't have to say no to everything Saying no, in fact, opens up more chances to say yes. Um, only now you'll be excited to use that Y word, uh, which um, will be like almost a shriek of yes, um, instead of a, a sort of many slight soft no's. Um, so yeah, uh, your life will start filling with the activities that bring you joy and, in, and fulfillment as well. Uh, so, and it all simply starts with the word no. So yeah. No is a good word. Um, okay, so we're on to, Tabby, the making time for your own practice. Um, this has no sound clip or video. The, this, I, I take this to mean uh, learning develop and development of your own creative practice. Um, as well as, because uh, I work in my creative practice, it also, I think this is applicable to people who are beginning to work in it as well. <laughs> um, it's a... Uh, a misheld and common belief in uh, in certainly in my industry that when you've trained or you've been working in it for a long time or you're classified as an industry leader or whatever that you no longer need to learn and train um 
I think this, that's, that's not the case. And the best people um, don't think they already know everything. Rather, they see life and their careers as a constant learning curve. Um, there are a long list of amazing people uh, in every art form who continue to do this from world-class writers to uh, some of the most how the biggest household name actors that you know of um, all go to at least at least one uh, workshop a year uh, to keep developing themselves. Um, I for example uh, started off this lockdown with a massive list of uh, things I wanted to do uh, to further myself. I haven't done them all because I was being a little bit overzealous, but there there have been some. I went from trying to learn BSL to uh, to all sorts of all sorts of things, and uh, that's fine. You know, I, I got to some of them, but um, not BSL, sadly. One day, um, uh, my advice, therefore, is to go out and find masterclasses, mentors, and workshops, and anything else that will stretch you, uh, because there's nothing worse than being stagnant and getting a bit bored of your regular daily tasks really um whereas i certainly find in my career i have to constantly keep learning things anyway to make projects happen um the it's yeah i i on a project we did a couple of years ago called a play a poet and a pastry i suddenly had to learn how to teach people out the art of origami um, where, as we were origamiing uh, hundreds of programs for each show, so the people would unfurl a, what was it? It was a flower, one of them, that turned into a program um, and whatnot. But you know, the thing, they just keep on going. Um, and uh, the more you learn, you, the, you, you'll never regret it as well. So, uh, yeah, it's hard though. And uh, the thing that makes it hard for me, and I think it makes it hard for lots of people, is that you're almost on this conveyor belt or it feels like it on your career and life and to find that bit of time to put it out there and try to learn something else because feels like it's really difficult to do um so i try to do learn one new thing every other month and uh and then practice it in the month between so that's how i do it okay I think we're on to the next one. Balancing your health and well-being. And this has so a sense. All of us wrestle with a terrible fear of failure. And that fear of failure constantly impedes our creativity. Now, what is it we're afraid of when we're afraid of failing? It's not necessarily um, material suffering because very many of us are above material suffering. We're living in the West nowadays. We have safety nets. We have uh, systems that will save us from the worst kinds of material deprivation. What we don't have is anything to save us from humiliation. That's the thing we're all really terrified about, being humiliated. Um, and that's what we need to find a, a way to deal with. Yeah, so that, that was the fabulous um, Alain de Botton, if I'm going to say his name properly, which I'll try, um, who uh, heads the School of Life, who uh, he's a fabulous uh, contemporary philosopher and uh, is worth a listen to. He's got several podcasts, that's one of them, in fact. Um, so it, I've been looking at this a lot recently uh, because I think I mentioned it at the start, fa failure has a really bad press. Um, I think you can turn it around to see failure as a natural route to, su to success. Um, and if you can do this, you'll find your journey much smoother. Uh, I personally learn a massive amount on each project I run and I'd be worried if I didn't anymore and that generally happens because of the mistakes rather than the successes on each project um, and yeah so bring on the failures um, I, I've lost count of the amount of funding applications for example that I've had turned down um, uh, or mistakes that I've made in a project I remember making some fairly horrific contractual mistakes before in the past where i've had to pay people more than i was meant to pay them and you, you know there's just things you do and therefore you learn the processes of what you're going to do so you don't do that again um and that that's okay uh, i know that every time i fail i'm closer to learning why and then i'm even closer to achieving whatever the goal is that i'm setting out to do um also uh a lot of my zooms recently i'm basically been a zoom monster um and uh on zoom most days like i think a lot of us have probably been um 
and uh, a lot of the hot the hot topic I've been talking about recently is burnout um, in the, the in the creative industries in the theatre industry for me, uh, and it's one that I think is applicable to everyone in the arts. It's how do you um, ultimately how do you work enough to move your career forward and also juggle the ever present work life balance and not basically having to take uh, several months off <laughs> every 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 while. Um, it's really hard because it's a stressful industry to work in. There isn't, uh, there's never enough funding out there. There's never enough money. So you can just focus on your creative art and not have to worry about paying your mortgage or, um, I don't know, you, is your electricity going to come in too much this month? Cause you've been on zoom all month or, you know, whatever, but, um, it's, uh, worries are there. It's constant. Um, I find it incredibly hard to balance, but I have found tactics through my life. Like, uh, I personally do, I think it's a fairly horrible buzzword, but mindfulness um, training. And I do a bit of meditation every day before I start working um, because I find it really helpful to be really present when I'm about to work. And then ideally you'd meditate again after working. So just for 10 minutes, so you're able to go back to your regular life without carrying everything you've just worked on and all the stress that you're doing. Um, and it's really, it's hard. Um, if you've ever, if you're able to have a defined line um, between your personal life and your work life, um, I find that very much easier to be able to cope with any knockbacks that you get in either and it not to impact on the other, um, if that makes sense. Because it's uh, um, I've certainly done this for a long time and I know a lot of people that have, have their, their work life is their personal life and so forth and so back, um, which means that I don't know, you have a breakup in your personal life and suddenly you stop being able to work or uh, your working life has a massive setback, like you don't get the funding or whatever, or the bit of art doesn't get into the gallery or something. And uh, and therefore that throws off your personal life. So it's, it's difficult, but it's trying not to have everything in the same apple cart, I think. Um, so, and the other, obviously we live in, we all live, I believe, I don't know if we all do, I'm assuming we do, all live in this fabulous region of Dumfries and Galloway, um, which has, uh, even, even within our previous five mile distance, we're allowed to drive a, a beautiful countryside walks um, that we can go on to take ourselves away from all of that stress. Um, I like podcasts while on a country walk um, or listening to music. Um, it's just find what works for you ultimately, but making sure you dedicate some time for you and what makes you feel relaxed. Um, okay, again, referring to Alain de Botton, who obviously I'm currently um, in awe of, um, he said that the pursuit of eternal happiness is one of the biggest lies we all fall for. In fact, we as humans may only experience a few hours of sublime happiness in our entire lifetime. And this is normal, okay, and not to be worried about. If we accept that life can sometimes be crap, then it can be easier to take the falls on the way. Um, I, I, I think that's a really uh, sentient piece of advice from him. And it's because uh, I think we worry quite a lot. I certainly do. I have historically certainly um, worried about um, everything isn't going okay. I'm not super happy at all points. So therefore something's not going right. But I think that's just normal. So it's, uh, it's okay. And just, yeah, life will progress anyway. Um, I think that's it for me. That, um, thank you for listening to me. I've gone slightly quicker and yeah, but a little bit faster than I'd intended. So if you didn't understand or pick up anything, please shout and I can reiterate anything. Um, well, we've got, some, it... we've got some questions for you, Phil. Thank you for that. I was yeah. fascinated. I've got some questions. I'm sure yeah. other people do too. Okay. So um, one of the questions I have is, have you got suggestions of specific tools for time management that we can use? Um, oh, yeah, there are loads. Um, Depends what you're doing. If in a project, I'll use things like they're called Gantt charts quite a lot. Um, or I use a very free program called Freed Camp, um, F R E E D Camp, um, which is a, um, it has a calendar section in it, which you're able to put all of your tasks into. And they also go into different to do lists for each section you're working on. 
um, and it all comes together and splits up. It's a, it's kind of a fabulous free tool, uh, which enables certainly me to manage what five or six projects at a time without going insane. Um, Sorry, just say the name of that again for us, please, uh, Phil. Freed Camp. So F R E E D C A M P. Okay. You can just find it on. It's an online thing, so you can just uh, use it online. Cool. Um, another question is suggestions for how we would go about finding mentors within our own creative practices. Oh, that's a good question. Um, okay. Um, I suppose it will be looking out to the organisations in your locale. Um, so if you're looking to be a visual artist, I would probably personally go to Upland um, and speak to them and say, where, where, where would I find one? If not, and you can't find who that organisation is, I'd probably come to, to you guys in DGU and go, how can you signpost me to who, where I can find a mentor? Because there are loads of people out there. We found one after we moved here for a, few, you know, a couple of months and one found us. So you were, you, if you put it out there, you'll find one. Is it like a formal thing or is it almost like a friendship, something that they just do out of, uh, in a philanthropic way? It, it depends. It depends. You can have both. I've had one through NTS in the past and through Creative Scotland. Um, but we've also got one who a lot of you will know who, who used to run something in the arts industry in this region who used to, who um, uh, is a kind of more ad hoc um uh informal kind of one um and uh it, it's uh both work very well um it depends where you are what you're trying to do in, in your world if you're it's sometimes difficult to dedicate if you're a full-time artist or you're struggling between splitting between your current employment and an artist role uh, i think it's probably quite difficult to dedicate a day a week to go and see someone but i don't i don't know it's it's finding what works as a balance for you I would... yeah so just to say that our icc fund again does support um the costs associated with mentoring so um do, do consider that and check out the website oh, fab, 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 fab. yeah that's great because because uh, otherwise you're looking for a totally altruistic um mentor which is uh which you can find but they're probably lesser to, to be found um, just because everyone has to live. Where can we find more information about the contemporary philosopher and the school of life that you were quoting? Oh yeah well he had there is a website of called school of life. Um, Alain is the bloke who he's got a fascinating history uh, I think one of his parents was something in the it was in the holocaust in something horrific and something was in uh, well another one was a uh, was a massive artist i believe at a different point and he was born of this and he's he's yeah he's fabulous he writes on love on uh happiness on relationships on failure on on everything he's a bit of a uh, stoic um philosopher um but he's fabulous i, I do like philosophy myself so um, yeah i'm probably a bit more leaning in that way but School of Life, and you can also do, in fact, I did a School of Life workshop, a webinar on, uh, I was part of it, I didn't run it, on, on, good God, um, on um, last week on Friday, where they are doing a lot of them at the moment, and they're fabulous. They get you to put you into breakout rooms, and you discuss stuff, and then it comes back to the table, and you all learn and develop yourselves along the way, so they're worth looking at. Folks, if anyone wants to say anything or speak to Phil or ask a specific question, please just give me a wave and, and we can include you in the discussion. I was interested in what you said, Phil, about failure, because it is something that helps you learn, but it's also one of the hardest things to get over, especially speaking for myself as a creative when I want to get it right and it means so much to me when we're creatives we make things that actually we're putting our heart and soul in so how do you get over the heart in order to allow it to be a learning opportunity because sometimes when you're a creative and you fail it's sore it's really sore 
yeah yeah that is it is it's true um it's uh um again i was listening to i'm listening to a lot of them at the moment i was listening to elaine just before this um i i, I always do a, a dog walk in the morning um just because it helps center me my day really um but uh he was talking about and i think he's right how um you look at whatever task it is you're doing before you do it and go right it's not there's a common word that we use of fine um of how are you feeling well, i'm feeling fine or uh how what what would make you feel fine about failing but well, you're not going to feel fine about failing but what would make you feel okay about failing i think is the the way to get it to um and um you know look at it and go what's the worst thing that could happen from you failing uh and then just if you've written it all down and look at it and go well how can i make that okay or is there a way that each section of this can be okay if i fail and you just have to basically face it um each time with everything you're doing and then failure is less of a smack in the face so it, it will happen more than it will not so and that's a, and that's okay i i think also um because i too have failed a lot in my creative career but there's a thing also about an element of this is it's not about you sometimes some of those failures so mm don't you know don't always take it that because someone else views that as as not what they want it doesn't it, it's it doesn't mean it's failed you can go elsewhere and it is then not class as a failure i mean i i'm a kind of madly enthusiastic amateur singer now with a choir and um joyce de donato is one of my huge um operatic heroes and, and she was told initially you know that she didn't have a career and here she is now almost described as the voice of her generation so that thing about it's not always about you and your idea sometimes it's it's where you're taking that idea to so you know, consider that and you know sometimes a careful thought about actually is this where uh, is this definitely what the area that i should be going to or the organization of the person so yes take from failure but don't always think that it's your failure oh no totally totally agree maggie totally agree yeah yeah yeah. No, but it's uh, and also there's there's great examples in the world that like those the the people who have just gone bashing in i'm gonna achieve this i'm gonna achieve this um regardless of the doors closing i think morgan freeman's a good example from memory and the fact that he uh didn't really make it onto being an actor until he was 50 i think or 40s or 50s year old and then he's been in some of the biggest films that there have ever been since um and that's part part of his life is because he didn't know he wanted to be an actor for a long time but also he kept struggling to become an actor um, and just kept bashing when he did realize but yeah i totally agree it's a it's that line isn't it between when you know you need to be an artist if you need if you absolutely need to be an artist you will find a way yeah. right. katie can you put kathy's my oh kathy oh. yes kathy uh, um well do you remember Richard Adams and Watership Down? He took it to, I think, over 50 publishers before it actually got published. And there's a you know, case of actually going on and on. And there's an awful lot of being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Very true. Very true. Philip, saying no, that's not easy when you're a freelancer and you're trying to pay bills. No, no, of course not. But it's, uh, I, and it becomes different points in your career when you, can do it easier um the you know uh, there's there's points where we've uh, i've well, i've i've generally seen lots of different um opportunities going on and earlier in my career it was easier to go i'm going to go for every single one of them um and try to get every single one of them where until i found a moment where i i found it was more powerful to only pick the ones that were totally perfect for me to go for um and and it but yeah becomes a stronger uh, proposition for me in each time um it is hard to say no yes it is hard, hard to say no but it's also valuing the rest of your life in those moments rather than saying yes to every single thing and finding yourself overburdened or doing stuff you don't really want to do um it, it, you know it's a it's a real balance it's a real balance and it's hard i won't pretend it's not hard but um but yeah 
Yeah, it takes bravery. It took me a few years to master the art of only doing what I want to do. It's mm. not easy. No, I'm still struggling with it now, if I'm being honest. You know, there's points where you go, should we do that? Should we go for that? Should we do? And you go, and, and more often than not right now, we go, no. We know what we're doing. We know what our goal is. We know what our milestones are as a company and personally. So it's just about getting those and I think working out if it fits alongside it or if it can help you push forward to where you want to be. And if not, then maybe don't. Does anybody have any more questions, Maggie? No, I'm, I'm just thinking about that, saying no, and and you you can also um, look at things from a different perspective, and and they are a vehicle to enable you. So sometimes I think yes, it's really important to say no to some things that are really negative, and and but it's accepting that actually there are things in here that I can amplify and build on in the project and that they will enable me or whatever it is, you know, they will enable me to get, um, to, to carve more time out to do the, you know, some of the things I want to. So I think there is a balance as well. Um, and, and it is about whatever stage you're at, but it's, it's that mentally changing your own, um, your own perspective sometimes on things there are times when it's definite you say no but then some of it if you examine a bit more carefully about yourself and your own view of things that that that, that can shift and, and make something a much more attractive proposition mm. yeah that and then that that kind of that your own mental framework and positive mindset helps it become more um positive i think as well no i'd agree, I'd agree. That makes sense. i would agree i would also say it's not about immediately saying no or yes i suppose that's the one of the things isn't it it's about turning it off from being an auto yes to things and just going because that's really easy just to go um so do you want to do this yes and then uh five minutes into it you've realized that actually that's not what the heck you wanted to do um but yeah so i think it's a balance at all points it's that okay. thing about time too isn't it the time um it's also being brave enough to say can i think about this and get back mm. to you or, or whatever yeah yeah totally totally okay thank you unless anyone's got any more questions i want to say thank you to everybody thank you to phil because you've given me lots of food for thought i don't know about the rest of you but i was taking notes the, all the little hints and tips that you were giving me so I, i'm going to take an awful lot from that um, um before i hand over to maggie to close today's session, I would ask you all to please fill in the feedback forms that our lovely Katie will send out to you. Um, and that allows us to see how we're getting on and how we're doing. And I believe that the next webinar is next Wednesday and it is Tina Fisk. And she is gonna be talking about nurturing creative partnerships and collaborations that's going to be a really interesting one as well so please do register and come along it's going to be at the same time next wednesday over to you maggie so oh, can i just butt in and say um, that there are links at the bottom of the feedback form to all our forthcoming webinars now so we've we've got ourselves more organized and there's some really good content coming up so please do share it with your friends thanks well um thanks to phil with tabby has already very eloquently expressed. I want to thank Tabby, um, who's a, a wonderful colleague to, to, to work with, um, brings sunshine and va 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 voom into our lives. Um, uh, she's worked um, a, a lot um, with me and the rest of the team developing the webinars. Also, I touched on with, with introducing Phil about that, you know, behind the scenes, all the things that need to be done. And that's the marvellous Katie, who's really well, wonderfully organised and has her hands full organising us, but she's doing it um, with great aplomb. So, and she managed um, this process in the booking. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful. Um, I, I really enjoy stepping out of the admin and the management and getting right in there with with fellow creatives. So I look forward to hopefully to welcoming you to some of the others and um, have a lovely rest of the day and take care. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank Katie, you. can you keep this? So I need to speak to Maggie for two minutes. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Stephen. Speak to you soon.